I'd like to call to order the Dover School Committee meeting on September 24th, 6.30, 6.32 to be exact. And um, with that, I'm wondering, do we have any community comments? Hearing none. Uh, next item on our agenda, we have a update, which we always look forward to from DTO um, co-presidents. So Jen and Martha. Uh, Martha's not here. She's oh, got um, okay. hip surgery. She's oh. recovering from. She okay? Um, she's okay. I'm going to pass this around. Oh, okay. Um, I did bring Ami. Let me raise your hand. Ami's our VP, and um, <laughs> I'm sick too. We're all sick. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, so um, she'll she'll stay to answer any questions. So Great. Hopefully. Thank you, Jen. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we thought, and I apologize, I don't have a copy for everyone, but we can certainly email these around. And we can now sure. uh, post them as part of the agenda. We'll scan them in and put them up on this side. Okay, sounds good. Um, so first of all, on the first slide, the second slide, we have key activities. And there are basically four broad categories. The first is faculty support and teacher staff appreciation. And we'll go through each of these in a little more detail, so I don't want to spend time on this slide. Uh, the second is curriculum enrichment. And those are programs for the children. And the third is community events and outreach, and that's both um, building the community across the parents and the kids, but also outreaching to the community around us. Um, and the last is capital projects, which we don't do frequently, but we have you know, that capability. And we did that more in the earlier years, and we can talk about that too a little later. So the um, board updates on the next slide. I just want to send the page numbers on this. Um, so the main change to the board this year was that we added METCO as a chair position on the board. Um, it was previously a committee role and, and it rolled up into the community outreach chair. Uh, but given how important METCO is to the school, we thought it would be good for the METCO um, representative to actually sit on the board. And who is that? Uh, Myla Clark has volunteered to do that. Great. And she'll, she'll be acting as a liaison and she's planning activities for the students. Um, next, under faculty and teacher staff support. So this is kind of like a laundry list of everything we do. Um, so teacher grants are actual grants where teachers have to um, write a description of what they'd like to grant for and apply for them. Teacher discretionary funds are just a $250 discretionary fund that they're allowed to use for whatever purpose they see fit for their classroom. Um, we then do a number of uh, sort of food-related <laughs> events where we bring food. So there's a dinner during the open house. Um, we bring snacks during parent-teacher conferences. Um, we do one teacher's brunch and one staff appreciation breakfast. Um, in May, we have you know this National Teacher Appreciation Week, and during that week, um, we give staff appreciation gifts, and then we do the store decoration project, which is quite a quite an initiative. Um, we do provide support for chickering administration events, and then there's of course the volunteer time that, that all the uh, parents give, you know, at lunch and, and other and library and other um, parts of the, the school. And then we have this Books in the Heart event in February where the children can um, can raise, well, they, they elect books that they want to have put in the library and parents pay for them. Then on the next slide, you have curriculum enrichment. So this is this year's programs. And it's we've been kind of rejiggering it over the years. Um, we've definitely been trying to negotiate the fees that we pay uh, these participants down because um, we don't want to, we, we're actually finding a fairly large uh, discrepancy in some of the amounts that we were paying visiting authors and we, we're trying to negotiate those down. So we have been replacing some of the, um, they're not the vendors, they're partners or they're, you know, they're, um, what's it called, the people we break in? Um, partners, let's call yes. them partners, yes. <laughs> um, I don't, do you have any questions about these? So this, this is largely, I mean, some of the ones like Audubon, we've been doing forever. Um, but we are varying up the teacher, uh, the visitor authors. Um, next on community events, support and outreach. Uh, again, just a list of things we do. So some of the, some of the events are really to bring the community together, like back to school picnic or um, Halloween night. And we are um, in the process of thinking about making it a bingo night instead of a movie night. So we've been doing that for a while and can, well, you know, we'll kind of change it up. Um, International night is a great hit and we started that a couple of years ago. And then we have events that are actually for the kids. So like science fair is an event that is really, um, the kids are the participants. Make a difference club is something that the fourth and fifth graders do. And so some of these are for, you know, the parents and the ones for the kids. MFA field trip is for the kids too. And then we have um, some things like outdoor classroom, fish tank maintenance, where we're just kind of, we have parents tripping in and doing things around the school for that. 
So um, on fundraising, we, we do an auction and check writing every other year. So auction year and check writing and auctions and check writing. And those are our main sources of uh, funding. And we'll go through the financials in a bit. Are we check writing this year? We're auction this year. We're auction, yeah. okay. We do, we do have secondary funding sources, and they include Dover Days, Books from the Heart, um, Directory, and Auction Advertising Easy Money Programs. Um, and again, we'll go through how much we get from each of those. So um, going to the financial overview, and hats off to Ami, who was our treasurer last year. Um, so Ami and I and uh, Hannah, you remember Hannah from last year, we spent two weeks last June actually trying to go through and analyze um, all our numbers over the last seven years because I think we had a lot of questions. You know, we have a lot of, um, we have turnover, right, on the board every year. Um, and it's hard to get that sort of historical picture of how much we spend and how much we need to bring in. Um, so this this slide right here, and this is really, it's, we're very proud of the slide. So it shows the, it shows the enrollment, first of all, because I think there's always been kind of a question, like our enrollment numbers changing? And there was sort of a conventional wisdom a couple of years ago that, um, that our enrollment numbers were shrinking. And as you can see, they really are not. And they've been pretty stable, you know, 512 students in 2012. And then today we're at 499 with just a little dip here in 2014 and it's down to 469. So we're, we're you know, this is a pretty stable enrollment. Um, you can see that the, the net income and direct expenditures though have fallen, um, I would say sort of incrementally over time. And what makes it very difficult for us to analyze these things, of course, is the fact that check writing and auction are very seasonal. So we get a lot more income on the auction years than the check writing years. So kind of have to average it. So you've got the seasonality, the biannual seasonality that occurs. Um, but on average, you can see this, the trend is, is, is slightly downward. And not by a lot. It's just a, a slight, modest um, decline. You might have this, but in terms of, you know, this is net income. Um, does this have to do with anything with the theme or you know what else is happening with other fundraising in the community, whether you're competing with DSEF or positive or anything like that? No, we, we haven't found it to be, um, we, we have not seen a meaningful change in any of those programs enough to think that it's causing ours to, or, you know, it's causing the decrease in ours. Um, I mean, you have any thoughts on that? I, mean, I, I think one thing I would add is that earlier on, and this is more because I think in the next slide, is that um, the PTO has applied for some, some fairly large grants. So seven, six, five years ago, the, the net income was much higher uh, because of those grants that the went to capital projects. projects right? Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, it's it's been fairly stable. Um, yeah, so the, ne the next slide has the dollar breakdown in direct expenditures, and just so you can see the percentages, you can kind of contrast that with the following slide. So uh, you can see the dollar breakdown, and what it means referring to is the fact that in like 2012 to 2013, we had $31,654 in capital projects, and that was the playground, I want to say. A lot of it was playground related. A lot of it was playground related, yeah. And so that the capital expenditures were pretty big in those early years that we analyzed. Um, and last year, for instance, we had we had zero. We, we contributed zero dollars to. And there was no expenditure in capital projects. So it, it's up and down. It varies, um, and we have the ability, to, you know, to obviously fund them. And we have um, we did the sign in 2016 and 2000. Sorry, 2017 and 2018, and um, we're doing some benches that are gonna that we bought over the summer that we'll we'll spend for this year. Very cool. Yeah. So in terms of the breakdown in direct expenditures, I actually find it more helpful to look at it in percentages. So if you, you know, pardon me, just if we go to the next slide. Um, so curriculum enrichment clearly is the biggest percentage of what we spend, um, ranging, it starts in 41% in 2012. You know, it's gone as high as 56% um, in 2014 and 62% last year. So, but it, it fluctuates, but that is our, our biggest, our biggest um, category. Um, and then the next biggest category is classroom and teacher support. And that's in the yellow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So have any questions? Okay. Uh, just quickly in terms yeah. of like curriculum enrichment, um, is there a, a mechanism to survey, you know, the educators or the administration on um, getting ideas? And if there is, then great. I'm, I'm just curious. You know, so 
as we do more pro as you do more programs, making sure that they're beneficial and they're sort of wanted. Yeah. So so two years ago, our curriculum and enrichment chairs uh, did a fairly mod moderate overhaul of the CE program by sitting down with each of the teachers and saying, hey, how effective do you think these curriculum enrichment programs are for this grade? Um, and I don't know if there's any feedback from you, Laura, or Deb, but I think, you know, they, I feel like the teachers are pretty engaged in the curriculum enrichment program. When I was mm -hmm. doing it um, as the liaison apparently done, we do meet with the teachers right. often to figure mm -hmm. out if it's working, If because sometimes the curriculum changes enough that it doesn't make sense anymore. So we were phasing some in and phasing some out. They met with the, um, all of the teacher liaisons in June um, and reported back to PTO on you know, changes in the program. And then after every event, there's an online feedback form. Perfect. All the teachers provide feedback on every event. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I, I apologize because I thought I had a breakdown of the income slides here. So I mean, I'm going to talk off the top of my head, but I do believe that the check writing and auction do form 80 90% of our incomes on the years they happen, right? Like the rest, over days, and all that is less than $10,000, if I'm not mistaken. No, you're looking at me. Okay. Okay. okay, we can always follow up with that. But I think if we go to the summary, so this, this is really what it is in a nutshell, which is, you know, looking at the last seven years, we've got pretty stable enrollment. The income, the average net income and the average direct expenses are, are very much in line. Scarily so, we were pretty amazed at this. So the average net income is 79,000 over the seven years. The average direct expense is 76,000 over these um, seven years. And, the, and both have been decreasing over time. Um, again, in 2012 and 2013, we made the, of two very large capital expenditures. Um, and then net income, the average income for check writing is 66, and the average income on auction years is 97. So again, this really big sort of seasonal change that we kind of have to manage over time. Um, that, that auction income, that's uh, gross, not net. That's gross, not net, yeah. And so our target um, currently, our, our policy right now is to hold at least one year's direct expenditure, which is around $80,000. Um, and that is based on an assumption that we, can miss an entire year of fundraising and still stay alive, basically. So that you know, so some disaster befall us and we can't put a board together or we can't get a fundraising chair, we could actually you know, stay solvent for a year. Um, and then quickly, the last slide is the 2019 to 2020 budget. So the total income expected is 100,000, 110. Um, this is marginally higher compared to the average auction year of 97, this is total gross income, so not net, excuse me. Um, and the total expenses expected are 106,813. I mean, this does include, and this is not direct expenses, this is total expenses, so it does include how much we have to pay to put the auction on. So the auction is, is a fairly you know, um, expensive proposition to, to, to put on, if that makes sense. Um, so our net operating income expected this year is negative, minus 6,703. So we're going to try to kind of make up that difference a little bit. There's a, for the teacher discretionary funds, uh, we allocate 250 for every teacher. And we know that about half of them actually use it year to year. Um, so we know that there is going to be about $6,000. Uh, and there are a few other places where we know that we will make up for that. Um, and so then the expenses for this year um, allocated in descending order. Uh, so the biggest is curriculum enrichment at 38,613. Um, so we you know, do want to note that we spent 41,218 on curriculum enrichment last year. And this year's um, s minor small decreases due to the fact that we're going to negotiate a lot of these, these down and replace um, uh, visitors with slightly less expensive alternatives. Uh, the classroom and teacher support is 23,350. And I do want to note that it's a lot, if you look at, compared to previous slides, it seems a lot higher than what we previously spent, which is on average 16,298, I'm sorry, last year. But last year's budget was actually 22,550, so it's only, it's only slightly higher than what we budgeted. Um, and that actually is mostly due to the fact that not all the discretionary teacher funds, that $250 per teacher is used. So this year, we're really going to try very, very hard to, to make sure they use them, because that money is sitting there. Um, 
We also have increased the amount that we're supporting uh, for the administration planned hospitality events by 2000 uh, because that has been running over budget over the last few years and um, and if we think you know we have enough money you know it's great for them to do more events if they, if they can. So that's in that 23? That's all in that 23 yeah. And that's kind of, I mean, we have the other ones too here, but that, that's pretty much it for the year. So we're on, we're on course. Is the auction going to be here again or? And then... So, yeah, so we've actually been exploring, our fundraising chair, Jackie Taylor, has been exploring, um, trying to put it, you know, somewhere off, off campus. Campus, is that right? right. Yeah. Uh, we got really excited because we thought Lookout Farm would be ready. And I guess they are having, um, they're not, their ventilation system is not being certified in time for us to do this so so jackie's currently looking at alternative venues and it, it, we we may end, very well end, end up having it here so we don't know yet but we're going to try to resolve this in the next 30 to 60 days yeah we have to figure out the next 30 to 60 yeah. days otherwise yeah. we're all going to be starting to sweat a little bit because that has pretty big cost implications i would imagine right yeah and and so powisset actually is an alternative as, as we know the middle school actually just had their yeah. um their annual night there and mm -hmm. apparently was a big success had 190 Tickets were purchased. We're still trying to get the final numbers on how much um, they actually raised. But um, but yeah, I mean, it is an alternative. And I think one of the things we're debating on the board is whether or not having sort of two local events in Pulisic in the same mm -hmm. calendar year is a little much. Um, so there's probably going to be some debate about that, but we'll, we'll have to figure it out. Yeah, there's the, the cost benefit of here, but the draw yeah. of a venue yeah. Yeah. Yes. Maybe yeah. Yes. Huh. to generate more interest. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, OK, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, if there's any time that you have anything you want to talk to the school committee about in the next calendar, you know, school year, yeah. feel free to reach out to me, and we okay. can add something to the agenda. Or if there's any time that you know you want to talk to us, and, and we can understand what you're looking to do or how we can help, you know, the more we can do together to facilitate you know, any dialogue with you. Well, That's great. Right. OK, thanks. One, one thing is uh, we're trying to open up a lot of our events to the larger community, so um, bingo night, we're inviting the Council on Aging as well. Um, International night, we'll put it in the newspaper, we'll open it to the whole community. So if you guys, if you all could come, that would be awesome. If you can bring some friends, that would be great. Um, either as atten attendees or even hosting a table to represent whatever culture that you do, so. I mean, that's an interesting idea about opening up to the community, because there's a lot of people that um, no longer get the benefit of what Chickering has to provide, but they used to. So, um, you know, thinking some of them would think about that and remember the days when you know, their children were running around here and um, could continue to want to support the school in ways other than that they currently do. So I think that's an interesting uh, thought and way to, to look at it. Great. Thank you, well, thank you very much. All right, um, this is where we move into the report section. And Ms. Dial, uh, thank you for submitting your principal's report. I was wondering if you wanted to go through any sort of highlights and things you want to touch on for, for all of us. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I want to thank the PTO for being um, wonderfully supportive of the whole school and very receptive of, of some ideas that we've talked about this year. We really want to create a an even stronger community. We want to create events for bringing parents in with the opportunity not only to support their children, but to have our, our parents um, talking with each other and having more opportunities for that. So I very much appreciate the PTO's efforts in that regard. Uh, the last couple of years, we've talked a lot about cultural responsiveness. We've talked a lot about inclusion and diversity. And I really feel this year that um, visibly, we're, we're seeing the positive impact from that. Uh, I feel that, that people are able to express themselves, their own unique selves, uh, even at the elementary level. Uh, and we really celebrate that, um, much less uniformity, I would say. Uh, so we're very, very proud and pleased with that. We continue that work for sure. Uh, one of our large academic initiatives this year is around RTI, or Response to Intervention, which is now under the umbrella of multi-tiered systems of supports. Uh, that includes enrichment as well as um, general supports for students, uh, and it also includes social-emotional learning. So we are on board with all of those. We also have an internal team that has been working for more than a year now, uh, planning what this looks like. We have teachers paired with each other, for really targeted intervention. 
So we've had many of these things in place. What we're doing this year that's different is it's systemic. We have teachers involved at a diff different level, and we're really excited about the impact it's going to have on kids. We're on our way with that. Uh, we continue to emphasize the need for project-based learning. We continue to integrate that into our lessons and units, uh, bringing the, the standard challenges and questions we have in school to the real world and asking our students to, to think about how to address those problems. Um, and in terms of our professional development, uh, that continues during our staff meetings, during our PD days. Uh, we're really excited about what's happening at the district level. Um, as well as what, what's happening at the school level. Um, I shared in my report the, uh, the goals, the common goals, which Assistant Superintendent Beth McCoy started um, last year. And uh, we've, we've shifted some of our school cult, uh, structures. Uh, we have precess, which started the last two weeks of the previous school year. Um, that has been very, very well received, not only by the students, but by the parents who say it's much easier to get the kids out the door in the morning because they're excited about getting to school for precess. We've also looked at best practices in terms of how kids respond um, to different parts of their day. Uh, learned that students who have recess prior to lunch um, eat a better lunch um, and have that much needed um, activity break. So um, Dr. Reinemann has uh, masterminded the, the school schedule so that every single grade now has recess first, lunch second, um, and that, that took some doing, but she, she made that happen. So we're really excited about that. Good things for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any questions? I have a question. I appreciate all the work you do with, with the community on the social emotional well-being of the students. And I've been speaking with some of my friends, and I realized that there is an in-district therapy dog. I was wondering if that was potential or a possibility to bring into Chickering. Uh, uh, we've had some conversations about that over the last couple of years, and something we're certainly interested in. Um, talking more about. Uh, I know that there is a dog that's used at Pine Hill mm -hmm. and perhaps the other schools, I, I'm not sure. Uh, the one at Pine Hill was uh, one of the outcomes of our nurse leader's um, graduate thesis. And so she's done a lot of um, work studying the, uh, the impact on students of that. We have um, some internal interest in bringing right. that forward. Um, so I think it'd be good to have some more conversations about that. Great, so it's on the table, it's mm -hmm. open, great. I know at, at the middle school, the CAGs, one, there's an animal CAG, and I'm just thinking they just met last week for the first time. Um, it's the Citizen Action Group, I think I'm saying that right. Um, the students are all involved, and there's an animal one, and they need to do something within the district um, in their November meeting. I'm just about they're supposed to come up with what it is, but that could be something that they could potentially get involved in bringing dogs to the elementary school. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There are I other that. organizations yeah. that partner with schools and other organizations to do that. Uh, and of course, there are certain measures that you need to put in place in terms of um, permissions and um, allergies. Those kind right. of things. If I could just clarify a little bit, um, Leslie, the, they, they have had the therapy dog and actually a pony Maybe <laughs> Pine Hill, right? Yes, but it's not. But it's not. But it's not the district's <laughs> therapy dog or pony. I, <laughs> just, I want to clarify that. But um, but the high schools actually use the therapy dogs on a, I think on a more regular basis and brought them in during exams and um, you know all of that had to be kind of go through a process of vetting and making sure that people were going to be okay and that in fact there weren't mm -hmm. allergies and the nurses had to be on board and people were informed that it was happening but it has proven to be a really positive thing in schools and um, i don't see how as a system looking at the social emotional well-being of kids we couldn't couldn't look at that as well i think that'd be great yeah. i just want to say i work at i work at nesca where they are doing neuropsychological testing on children and there's a dog there and I noticed that all the children come out from their testing and they just pet this dog and this mm -hmm. dog clearly relaxes them. And I just feel like it could be a wonderful addition. Right. To we actually out. had one in uh, during summer services about five years ago. Uh, and we did we did see that, that really positive impact. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. 
Anyone have anything else? I had a question. Um, so Rachel and I were in the guidance advisory uh, meeting on Friday, and from the middle school, the direct spoke well, director, the gentleman that works with the um, grit program, the new grit program, came in to talk to us, and. Um, it was really interesting. I was wondering while he was talking, is there anything that's similar here, or why are you smiling at me? <laughs> uh, we actually were talking with our student health team okay. this week about wanting to go to the middle school, oh, okay. learn about that program, and, it was brand um, new. And, and build a stronger understanding across the whole district. Okay, he was really program. impressive. Yes, yeah. yeah. What mm -hmm. they're doing there. Yeah. yeah. It would be a wonderful addition, I would think. And then, um, Recess, you know, we've been hearing about these bills in the uh, the state house about length of recess. Are we compliant with the 20 minute recess? Okay. okay. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Just a little bit extra. <laughs> it's D, it's DS, right? Gotta go over and Thank above. Thank you. I, I did want to add some really recent news. Uh, today there was um, an article in the patch that. Um, there were 67 schools that were received recognition um, under MCAS accountability, and Chickering was named um, as having received that for high achievement and high growth. Um, so that's exciting, and we keep it in context, but I want to give a special shout out to Dr. Reinenden for running this incredibly complicated system, which changes every year. Uh, it's, it's quite a system, and certainly to our families and our students who, um, who work so hard to, to show what they know, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big event, and the, the teachers have done an incredible job training and working with a digitized system. So. Well, when we get Dr. Reitman's annual report, <laughs> which you make a complicated process look pretty easy for us, <laughs> we look forward to hearing all that. That's great. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Anything else? I just have a, a couple of, I don't know if it's encouragement or observations, but um, you know, thinking about the therapy dog idea, precess, um, I know you and um, Barbara over at Pine Hill, uh, the principal over at Pine Hill, do more going back and forth and sharing ideas. And I think the more we can do that, I mean, obviously the schools are unique and have different sort of personalities, but anytime we have the opportunity to think about what do they do and if we can integrate it without upsetting something significant here and vice versa. You know, I'd say the same thing over to our colleagues in the Sherman School Committee. Um, it's great because they share ideas, you get, you learn from each other's, you know, maybe things that you maybe might have done differently. Um, but then when they come together um, in sixth grade, they have some similar experiences. We're doing a great job with that curriculum wise, but if there's other things that we can do it's not a budget issue because these aren't really expensive things we're talking about. These are just nice things that if we can find um, little nuggets to take advantage of, and that's a great example of one to think about. Um, I also love, and we'll hear about this a little bit more with the Portrait of a Graduate, but the critical thinking that you mentioned, or you know, um, I think talked about uh, project-based learning, actually. The more that, you know, from K to 12, as a graduate sort of goes through and goes through the door of experience, the, the, the base, the building block is here, or Pine Hill, right? So how the base builds on itself to get to, you know, a 12th grader, starts at the elementary school and thinking about project-based learning and those type of things and the more we can continue to do that is fantastic so well, thank um, you just sort of an observation that. i've always felt that at the elementary level we have the this incredible gift of building that foundation for kids for their k-12 experience as well as beyond so it's very exciting and i completely agree with uh, the benefit of sharing ideas across both elementary schools and we've been doing more and more of that every year and, and the grit program is a great example of um, programming in another school in the district that um, is, ad is addressing the social emotional learning needs um, in a slightly different way from how we've addressed them here through the center for regulation and academic resiliency um, so yeah good to, good to learn more from each other thank you thank you um Next, I get it printed, great, uh, is um, Ms. McCoy. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll just point out a few things on my report, and then I want to spend the majority of my time um, just highlighting the portrait of a graduate as a draft and where we stand right now. Um, so just to say about the leader retreat, leadership retreat, we had great two days together this summer. Um, I think all of us hands down felt that the best part of it was having some of our rising seniors come and do a fishbowl conversation where they kind of 
talked among themselves in the middle and the rest of us observed. Um, we did have an open chair in the middle where we could jump in and ask questions. Um, but just hearing about their experiences pre-K through 12, well, K through 12 at that point, um, and, and what really resonated them with them as, as um, learning experiences that stuck with them and really made a difference in both their skill set and their content knowledge set was, um, was really powerful. And from that, you know, they should be really proud because the two points that they highlighted as the relationships that they have with adults in this district and how strong they are, as well as those teachers who have gone out of their way, not only to engage them in the curriculum, but empower them and give them the opportunity to kind of have some voice and choice and, and dive into areas of need actually has affected the entire district because um, those are now our focal points for observations um, as all of us go into classrooms. We're going to be looking at, you know, culture and climate and relationships as well as opportunities for students to be empowered. So um, our students are driving the work, which is really exciting. Um, the Envisioning DS 2035, we had um, 65 teachers come in in August to kind of say, okay, now that we have the portrait of a graduate draft, what are the next steps? Um, eight of whom were from Chickering, which was great. It was another example of, you know, the cross school um, collaboration that we saw in the morning. We spent time all mixed up, you know, tables where elementary, middle, and high school teachers in the afternoon, they got to kind of separate by school to talk about next steps specifically for them. So that was a really powerful day. Lots of positive feedback. Um, and no, these weren't cherry picked. Most, you know, all of the feedback was positive. So either the, the naysayers didn't respond or there, there were a few of them, I don't know. Um, so that being said, I'd love to, you know, have the round of applause, drum roll, Portion of a Graduate Draft is here. Um, you know, I just want to commend the, you know, I think it was originally 59, we settled at 57 member committee, representative of students, teachers, um, parents, community members, administrators who came together and spent hours and hours and hours um, last year um, researching what our students need for success in college and career and in life, synthesizing their information um, and really um, boiling it down to this image. I think unless you served on the committee or you live in my house, you don't really understand the depth of this. Um, uh, but it's really exciting. So this is where we are right now. Um, we have a tree from our own community that uh, Darren Buck, um, a graphic designer and teacher at the high school, um, drafted. Um, in the center of everything, you have the, the heart, the DS for empathy. We believe that empathy is the most important part of development for our kids. We, grow, um, we ground our work in the growth mindset, meaning that you might not know something yet, but it's just a matter of time and effort before you get there. Um, we are looking to develop a love of learning, which is why we have the child reading a book um, and, and wanting to continue to learn over time, um, all within the context of obviously the Dover Sherburn Boston tree, but in you know keeping in mind the larger global community that we want to prepare students to make an impact on. Um, we have our competencies defined. Again, this is a draft, it's a working draft. And uh, at this point, we kind of have three layers of work happening. Um, members of the Innovation Committee and I are going to be taking this on the road, and it starts actually tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. I'm meeting with the high school student council to share this and get feedback and talk about next steps and what we should, you know, uh, preserve as a district and celebrate as a district, what we might let go as a district and what we might explore as a district. Um, we'll be meeting with PTOs, CSAs, CPAC. We're doing the whole tour. Um, so we have that getting feedback to see you know, if there's any changes or adaptations that needs to be made. Um, other than that layer, we have lots of conversations happening with the, within each of our four buildings with faculty about what do we already do in support of these skills? What can we teach each other? Our full day of professional development on December 2nd will be an opportunity for teachers to share with each other what they're already doing. Um, so that's exciting. And then we also have a number of teachers who are either um, innovators or what you call early adopters or the early minority who have latched onto this or have been doing this for years um, and continue to pursue professional development opportunities, whether it's um, benefiting from the DSEF grant for innovative classroom spaces. And we have a member of the audience who could talk about that if she'd like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a um, Chickering, a Pine Hill, and two middle school teachers engaged in the FUSE program, which is an opportunity for our educators to learn how to personalize learning by making playlists where students can pick and choose their topics based on readiness and level and interest so that not everybody is learning the same thing in the same way at the same time. And they'll be coming back to coach their colleagues. 
um, Petra Ilo, who the principals and I met in Finland and was our host there, showing us about teaching and learning in Finland, is actually coming here in late, Octo in late October. And he's going to spend time at each of the schools. Um, and any volunteer teachers who want to spend some time with him and kind of learn about either project-based learning or what they call phenomenon-based learning, they'll have an opportunity to engage. Um, so lots of exciting things going on. And lastly, I'll just mention the um, ticket to travel. So as the principals and I had an opportunity to travel abroad, um, thanks to DSCF, we have had um, an opportunity to send teachers nationally, domestically this year to other schools um, all over the country to um, explore best practice and bring it back. So we gave everyone at the start of the school year a ticket to travel. Um, we had an opportunity to Skype during our summer workshop with Ted Dintersma, who wrote um, What Schools Could Be, um, which is a really popular book right now, you know, kind of in our world of education. Um, and his advice was that you don't need to travel to California or to Washington State to learn things. You can actually learn things from your own district. Um, so you don't have to spend a lot of money. So we have a lot of teachers who are actually either coming over the river to Chickering, over the hill to Pine Hill, up to the middle school, um, and taking advantage of the actual ticket to travel that they have. Um, and we also have others who are applying to go either to um, Minnesota. Um, we have some going to Atlanta to a STEM school there. Um, and there's interest in a California school as well. So, you know, thank you to the principals for supporting these professional days out of the building and also to DSCF for supporting you know, the innovative spaces as well as these opportunities for our um, educators to get out of the bubble. We realize and appreciate what we have in the bubble, but sometimes it's neat to bring things back to. There's wonderful schools within the state um, mm -hmm. that have very different profiles than us that could just offer it just by going 10, 15 miles in any direction. You could probably find something new there too. So. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything? Feedback. Sure, quick comment. Um, we went through a very similar process in Needham, and I love hearing your process and just the um, kind of the cross representation you had in your original committee, and then this um, back and forth of some drafts and what do you think, getting some feedback from all stakeholders. And I think the real benefit we also saw was that there was such buy-in. I mean, by the time you get to this point, I, I would assume you're feeling the same. Um, people are excited about having a unified kind of frontier and facing and reflecting on what they do in the classroom. And maybe it is some things that they've always done, but now they can put it into a broader context and kind of get the colleague next door on, on board with trying something new or, you know, even openly talking with students and saying, well, we know we have this focus now. And uh, we've always aimed to be great educators, but now we're articulating what it is and what that looks like. And we're giving opportunities for everyone to take some risks. And I applaud the district for going there. Thank you. Thanks. Beth, did you just say Yes, please. Sure. Um, so I was part of the innovation committee, but I also was lucky enough to be part of the grant for flexible seating. And I'm in second grade now. So um, we, we had a workshop that was great that talked, we all talked about different ideas. And it's been a great great um, change for me from my classroom. It's just such a different vibe. You don't have those seats that you sit in. And um, I have couches, and my kids have wobbly stools, and they have stools that they sit in. And there's a different place for everybody. And it's it's interesting to watch that everybody tries other, you know, they're on the wobbly stool one day, they're on the floor one day. And first, I thought I would have a hard time with that, because I kind of like the structure of go to your seat. But it's been great, and the kids have embraced it. And it's nice to watch them be so comfortable in their learning spots. Mm -hmm. And it was funny. I had some parents who, even before we talked about it, they were like, I'm so glad you do flexible seating because you know, kids do need to be up and about. And I was telling a friend about it this summer, and it was interesting because he works at Bank of Boston. And he's a, like a big wig and vice president or something. And he has a corner office. And he lost his corner office. And now he has flexible seating, basically. <laughs> so he has to go in and find a place to work and a place to collaborate and a place to communicate. And so when we talk about 21st century learners, I think flexible seating and just all of the things that come with that will be so helpful. So seventh grade or seven-year-olds are starting. We could do a field trip. I was going to say, can we build yeah. that in? Or we could even have our meeting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We really want to go to the extreme, <laughs> and you know, instead of dipping our toe in, jumping the two feet, that could be uh, yeah. you, an interesting idea. Yeah. Next school committee meeting in your classroom. You can have a yoga ball. <laughs> yes, the yoga balls haven't come out that much, but they will. So, and it, it was great that open house parents sat on them, and you know. Oh, that's great. Yeah. 
Thank you, Max. Um, one thing, and it came up from their trip to Finland that a few of you guys went on, and you're talking about, I love how they call it um, phenomena-based learning, but I remember trust being a reoccurring theme. And when I read your report about you know, the envisioning 2035, it popped out about the observation about the relationship between the students and the educators. I think trust is a theme there. Mm -hmm. um, and then even in your quotes, you said you grabbed some of the Good quotes, but or the quotes that you got were all pretty positive. There's a couple of them that struck me, and the the one that really got me and it has to do with trust is I hope your ideas presented in the um, by the faculty are seriously considered and utilized to implement change in the coming years. And that to me was a okay. We've talked about it. Maybe in the past it hasn't always happened, but let's do something. And I think that's trust, and it's trust between the administration and the educators, the education and parents, the, te the kids everybody and um the more we can continue to build that it has to do with it, just communication and all the things that we like to try to do and but we are for we follow through then it'll help us in the long run thank you and that being said um we will come back to the joint school committee um later this year to kind of talk about our findings as we meet with stakeholders about the portion of graduate but also the principals are going to come and present their finished findings and lessons to you um, and also the evening with the superintendent, which is sponsored by Challenge Success on November 13th, will be an opportunity to hear all that too. So I encourage you to come and our audience to come and hear about all of the great things that our educators and, and students and parents are supporting the district and doing. Thank you. Great, thanks. That's great. Thank you. Always a lot going on. Yeah. Um, next is our superintendent's report. And if you recall, a more formal report was presented to the joint school committee meeting um, a couple weeks ago. So uh, the idea is there'll be more that is district-wide um, type of communication will be presented at our joint meetings. Um, so we'll see a little bit more specific content around, you know, chickering and obviously enrollment and whatnot is important. So um, obviously pay attention to your opportunity <coughs> packets for the larger reflections from Dr. Keogh. Um, but I know you have something you'd like to bring up for this meeting as well. Yeah, so I, I won't necessarily give you a written formal report if we've just had a joint uh, meeting, but I can still kind of speak to some of the, the key issues, and that's what I'd like to do tonight. Um, but before I do that, I, I have to um, I have to just say, <coughs> and I, I agree with what Mark said about <coughs> how important it is to to have engaged the uh, community community to the degree that we have in this process of developing this portrait of the graduate. And what I really love about it is that it really is um, something that most people can wrap their heads around. We all want our kids to be critical thinkers. When I see and hear from my children and they write things, I see their written work as Dover Sherwin graduates. I'm so impressed with their ability to think critically, to communicate effectively, to work collaboratively with others. These are things that we already know much of it goes on here at Dover Sherwin, but we've, we've now done a good job of really articulating it and saying it and identifying it in this portrait of a graduate, which is now a draft and should eventually soon become more permanent um, but it should really drive our thinking and uh, to that end i just wanted to mention something really important that beth just um, alluded to that the students that we heard from are, are graduating 12th graders they're pretty reflective at this point and they are very articulate and they were able to tell us the people running the district a little bit about ourselves that maybe we had always honed in on the way we should be. That relationships, that when they feel they have relationships with their teachers, it influences their learning in ways that we could never imagine. For example, these kids who are now how many years out of fourth or fifth grade? Quite a few were mentioning their teachers specifically by name. We asked them not to get into names, but they can't help themselves because these teachers from here at Chickering School have influenced their lives and their thinking. And they talk about being inspired by these people from five or six years ago in their lives, their very short lives. That is really telling. These are really capable kids graduating from arguably the best school system in Massachusetts. That says something. And so this portrait of graduate work 
this emphasis on relationships, these conversations about relationships, but more importantly, as Beth said, not just engagement. Engagement's kind of one of those, it's like educational gar jargon. You know, engagement, okay, what does that really mean? But empowerment, I get. So you empowered the kids. When we do this innovative classrooms, when we create these flexible seating areas, the kids feel empowered. I watched, I went in and talked to uh, Ms. Grady's students and other students at Chickering School and Pine Hill as well. And they talked about how they really love these spaces. Now that's a fairly telling thing because they're actually talking about the learning space, the place that they go to learn every day, they feel good about. And I asked them a silly kid question. So do you guys fight over these spots? No, 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 we know which ones we prefer and everyone's kind of worked that out. There's our little collaboration thing where they're working together. So I just, I can't say enough about that, about the, the courage it took for our teachers to take this on, to take a chance, mm -hmm. because you could have just come in and had your chairs all lined up and been done with it, but you didn't. You took that chance. You took the chance by approaching DSEF with other people and asking them to take a chance. Mm -hmm. And some really cool stuff is happening. So kudos to all of you. When you hear from DSEF, which you will, they've got a great phone base, <laughs> and they're also having their gala at, um, at uh, Patriot Place on, on November 2nd. So you should be hearing more about that. We rely on DSEF and of course the Dover PTO and the, the, the same with Sherwin, the CSA. We rely on these parent support organizations because they fund these kinds of cool initiatives. So I couldn't let this evening uh, finish up without saying those things. Um, now to some uh, more kind of nuts and bolts uh, stuff, uh, just quickly. The, uh, I wanted to mention, I put in your um, packets, you are, kind of very preliminary enrollment numbers. But uh, what these should show you is that, and, and by the way, we typically try to stay away from September numbers, but we really are getting close to October 1st. The state has identified October 1st as the date that we put forward our reports to them. They wanna know what our actual numbers are on October 1st, and that's because there is still a lot of in and out in September. But um, we will be doing our October 1st reports uh, obviously pretty soon and um, submitting it by October 1st. But the 491 that we have here, which is actually 482 without the pre-K, we projected um, 485 to 496. So we, the, our, what this tell, tells me and should tell all of you is that our projection models are pretty good and the same actually held true in Sherburn. So that's a really good sign. It means when we are budgeting and thinking about how many sections we need in a small school system where you may only have three or four. Well, we, we run four typically in five, but one, one reduction or addition when you're running four sections can make all the difference mm -hmm. in the world. It's a lot different than a big high school where you're running 10 sections. Mm -hmm. One addition or subtraction can make all the difference in the world. So our projections are really, really important to us when we build our budgets because we know people get anxious. We build our budget and invariably somebody says, have you seen how much building's going on in town? Are we really gonna have enough sections? Are our class sizes gonna be too big? And I've come to really depend on, um, on Dawn in this way. I think she has really good instincts. I mean, I trust our numbers, but I also think um, we are very lucky to have Dawn in this role because she stays steady. She was the one who was saying, we're gonna be fine on our section sizes. And, um, and I think we are. Mm -hmm. So uh, a tip of the hat to Don. Um, just, just, for, just for your own knowledge, um, we have 17 new students here. Yeah. And that's a lot. And at the high school and middle school, I believe it's 43. That is a lot of kids moving in. So that's why I wrote about it in my newsletter, mentioning the fact that we have new students. New students can, can really be vulnerable. Some kids make it the transition, it's not a problem. But I encourage all of our parents to have those conversations with the kids, to make sure that they're taking care of the kids who are new to our system. It's, it's part of being a welcoming community. Um, I also included in there for your review, the new hire information. 
Uh, what's in, really important about this is that um, this is really our SPED reorg coming to fruition. And uh, we're incredibly excited uh, as a system, I think we are, but especially in, on the leadership team about already the impact of Kate McCarthy as our director of student services. This model of having a director of student services as opposed to just a director of special education and really no student services director at the elementary level. So we now have a K-12 director of student services, but we also have brought in Naomi O'Brien as an elementary coordinator. Um, she has been terrific. She has a tough job because she has to work both sides of the river. And um, that just travel-wise can be a challenge. The people she says have been wonderful. Both administrative teams have been wonderful. The staff has been wonderful. The kids are great. So, um, but, but one of the things that's really, really fantastic in my mind, we're trying to, <clears throat> I love that, that movie, um, Field of Dreams, and build it and they will come. We are doing some things that are really cool. And if you don't believe me, ask some people who are coming from other systems, like Naomi or Kate. And they go out and tell people from their systems, they're doing some really cool stuff there. They had a great leadership retreat this summer. They're talking about some of the stuff in, in their leadership meetings that we really love. And other people are attracted to that. And that's a great thing for a school system, because you like to attract the best. So. Um, we're psyched and really, really pleased with uh, those changes. Laura Driscoll's doing a great job in this new role um, as a team chair for both Chickering and Pine Hill. We are going to monitor this. Monitor this. We have to, because this is a change. One team chair for two elementary schools. Will it work? We believe it will, with the addition of an elementary coordinator. But it has to be watched. It's not like we just made this change and then we wash our hands and move away. So. Um, this is really important. Uh, same thing with the uh, the adjustments up at the central office, hiring Carrie Campbell as an administrative assistant for Kate. Um, so uh, Raseel Fatek, the therapeutic counselor, we're very excited to have her here. She's had a great impact. I'm sure Lauren and Deb can speak to her as well. Um, Dan Davis uh, has uh, come over as a music teacher. He's been working at Pine Hill, I think. You're going to see, as I have, when I go and see him with the kids, he does an incredible job. He's really, really a, a fascinating teacher to watch. Uh, Eugenia, uh, fantastic as a new FLUS teacher. So um, Priscilla Stefan as a literacy teacher, Anna Sawin, a FLUS teacher, um, replacing Laura. It was a tough loss for us to lose Laura. Fortunately, she went to the middle school, so that's a positive thing. She can kind of bring her messaging and her um, her strengths up there, uh, and Stephanie Hartz um, replacing Priscilla. So, uh, of course, we have some great educational assistants, but I wanted to share with you the, the names of the new folks and uh, just a little bit of background about them. And then finally, I wanted to mention that, um, that of course, uh, as you can imagine, we spent a lot of time in the past few weeks on the um, E situation. And um, <clears throat> that has not been easy by any stretch. Uh, we don't all come to the table with the same opinions and philosophies about how we should raise our kids. Some people get very, very nervous about it. Some people are not so concerned. Some people say, just put some bug spray on and go on, go on out. It'll never happen to you. Others do not feel that way at all. Others do not like the bug spray, period. And so I pretty much have heard from everyone. Uh, and, um, but I will tell you this, uh, first and foremost, we are taking it incredibly seriously. We do pay attention to what's going on at the state level. And we do pay attention to uh, the Board of Health in Sherburne and in Dover. They are from different counties. That is one of our challenges, right? Sherburne's in Middlesex, Dover's in Norfolk. Over has Norfolk Mosquito Control managing their local ground spraying. Sherburne has um, Central <coughs> Mass, it's called. Um, they have some potentially different philosophies at times about ground spraying. The aerial spraying, they don't get to decide. 
the state has just said, we're doing these areas that are high or critical and they have done it. So there has been a lot of spraying. There, I can tell you that there has been spraying around Chickering and that there has been aerial spraying over the two towns. That's not a guaranteed protection. So obviously we, that's why I wrote my letter uh, a few weeks back about the importance of protecting your own children and making kind of executive decisions with regards to your own kids. You might say, hey, some parents take chances like that, I'm not going to. Others might say, I'm not concerned about it, so I'm, I'm not gonna stop living, I'm gonna let my kid do whatever it is that's going on outside. Parents at the end of the day have to make decisions for themselves. This is something that, uh, you know, I can't make a decision for every single parent in the system. So we're trying to be respectful of that. We're trying to maintain the learning experience for kids. I feel badly, I feel really badly that we do not have Friday night games. And it's not just for our high school football players. I feel badly for the kids who are running around behind the stands and don't watch any of the game, but they're having a blast, but they can't because that's been um, uh, kind of put aside because we just can't take those chances. So I think that's a shame, but uh, we're, we are paying attention and we are hoping and praying for a hard frost <laughs> because we need about four hours of uh, temperatures of 38 or below. And that's asking a lot. This is about 90. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, when we, we've had a few kind of light frosts, I know in the area, but it's it's in small little pockets and not enough to uh, eliminate the mosquito population. So that's an ongoing challenge that I just wanted to kind of make sure that you guys were aware that we are, and we'll always put the safety of the kids first. And you mentioned that outdoor programs like um, Nature's Classroom and Audubon sorry, are postponed until we have moved uh we have hail. moved, hail. Yeah, we've moved hail reservation out uh to um october. october end of october end of october um i lose track because in pine hill we have the same thing in middle school there's been some movement middle school oh. and pine hill shifted theirs we haven't changed our dates yet you haven't changed any of the dates nope, you asked us to wait till october 4th to see if we could get a frost <laughs> I don't know if that's so, going to happen. <laughs> well, because we still have time, those are okay. still a little ways out, and we can still make We're the change. We're going middle of October right now. Right. So that's why, that's why I said that, because middle of October is where some of those other ones have moved to. Right. So they were go we might already be OK. But by two weeks ahead, we should make a decision as to whether or not. It's not looking that great. Mm -hmm. It's not looking like uh, we're going to have that hard for us, so we may have to make an adjustment. Well, well, it reminded me, not that it can be used right now, but the nature trail that Oliver built, is that still in good repair and everything? It's well used. Okay. Well, it will be again. Yeah. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Laura or Deb, but I believe that the kids are, um, families are sending their kids with bug spray. Do you see the bug spray? It's, it's their choice. All right. Yeah, so we don't, don't see it once they're at school. We've seen a few parents on the sidewalk spraying their kids before mm -hmm. they come in. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really uncomfortable position for people. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just, it just is. It's really well, we're those people, we know, it's hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know you know, and I'm sure you get the calls too. Yeah. Uh, so any questions or comments for Dr. Keogh? I just wanted to let you know, um, in terms, we were talking about community outreach with all the new families. Um, we, not here, but at um, Guidance Advisory Council and Pete, the positive, and the high school PTO, we did an initiative this year where we reached out to the 40-something uh, new families. We matched them all up, and so everybody has um, a family that they're connecting with and having coffee with, and it's been really well received. That, that is, that's yeah. the best. <clears throat> that stuff, I mean... Maybe it's just me, but <clears throat> I think most of us feel the same way that that stuff has a lasting impact. Yeah. And the reason I wrote about that was because I was amazed that the kids were actually watching where I saw this kid by himself and it turned out he was a new student and I just went over and said hello and kind of engaged for a minute. But other kids were watching to the extent that they actually talked about it with their parent and they saw me go over and say hello, so they did it the next day. So the same thing holds true with all yeah. that you guys are doing. I think that's awesome. Yeah. 
Because if the shoe were on the other foot and it was mm -hmm. our child in a new school. Well, it was. I mean, we moved here right. in December with uh, four kids. And the, there was a someone's role was the new family coordinator for the PTO. And they had my family over to their house in December with my four children. And, like, took out the directory and was like, these are the, you know. And, like, she made me all these play dates. So when my kid, you know, my kids started in January and they had familiar faces and it made the transition so smooth for us. That's, so that's the best. I yeah. love hearing that. Yeah. When I was a high school principal, I learned quickly that the fixed seating at lunch tables is really not a great thing. And when we built the new high school in Wellesley, I insisted that we have additional loose seating all over the place so that you can always make room for one more kid. But if the table's set and it's fixed and that's it, we only have 12 seats around this yeah. table, no one else can sit here, that can be really tough mm -hmm. for that kid who's just trying to break in. So yeah. it's those little things that do make a difference. So I'm glad to hear that. That's awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, Don, moving on to the finances. Yes, uh, just to bring your attention to your warrant um, report. You, it's two pages mainly because we don't get to stop when school ends. So we continue to pay the bills throughout <laughs> the, the summer. So the first page is what you have left that was a applied to your fiscal year 19 numbers and the second page is what we paid today for your fiscal year 20 um, numbers and I um, I think Leslie for being your primary signer we have the opportunity to sit down and go through warrants last week and just bring her up to speed on sort of what the process is in central office so she's comfortable with actually signing off on things so thank you for that okay. and uh, um, so you'll have one of these on the monthly basis with everything that Leslie or whoever goes and signs. Yeah. Uh, and just to confirm, if, I mean, any school committee member could go in and take a look if they so yes. wanted yes, to. So absolutely. if there's something that you have a question about, A, obviously Don is, right. you can talk to, but if you want to go look at something, it's not like it's restricted to the signer or you. Like exactly. Sitting and most of, most of what goes over, we keep uh, copies in central office, which would, is the voucher number is the way we go pull stuff. So if you ever wanted to see something and you didn't want to go to town hall, we actually have copies of everything at central office if that's easier for people to yeah. come see. Thank you. John, these are all things that were already part of, part of the budget from last year, not additional things? This, yes, this is everything, right. This was already accounted for in the yes, budget. Yes, exactly, too. right. So we, we report to school committee every bill that gets paid mm -hmm. over the, over the town, yes. Um, so that puts us to um, looking at your uh, fiscal year 19 closeout report, which we were really where we thought we would be when we met with you back in May. So I really just started to summarize it for um, the old people and the new people. I can, um, anytime you want to come and have a quick budget one-on-one sit down, feel free to reach out and, and I'm happy to do that. But on salaries, if you recall, we were running a pretty large net positive salary variance, mainly to, uh, due to that one large, um, or that one position that that was unfilled in the Strategic Learning Center. So that's about half of that. And then we also had several um, staffing changes after the budget. So we had some long-term um, staff retire. And so when the new staff come on, there's obviously savings from that. So that accumulated to over $200,000 um, for last year. And on that Strategic Learning Center position, it was um, based on need. It was staffing not needed. Needs. Staff staffing needs, it was not filled. Um, that teacher actually moved to a different position within the school, but there wasn't a need to fill it, but it was, was already a student, in. There wasn't a student need. Right, there wasn't a right. cohort a that need. required right. for that type of program, um, but it was already in the budget. So. Exactly, so it stayed in the budget all year. It did come out of the budget for your fiscal year 20. Um, so it, it is now is now gone. Um, and your operating expenses, you really came within $60,000 of what we budgeted. Um, there were some variances back and forth that I tried to highlight, but you can also see those in the actual numbers in your, your statement. Um, out of district, um, you know, that, as you'll get used to it, that can fluctuate tremendously depending on what our current cohort of students um, are. Last year, we were over budget by 80,000. Um, we had budgeted for 32 placements when we did this budget almost a year before it, it goes out. And we ended up with 35 placements when we closed um, books on June 30th. So that is a, um, three placements probably would sometimes be more than 80,000, but in that you also had changes in placement, some uh, kids coming back at different rates. So. That is a big pool of money that you can see wide variations. So you will 
on a by quarterly basis, I give you a report where you can see more closely how that population sits with and ins and outs, um, what grades they're in, what kind of schools they're in. So we provide that for you um, periodically. So when you get down to the end, we have um, um, obviously finished with a positive variance for the operating fund of 184,000. Um, in addition to that, we have a, we returned to the town 100% of the circuit breaker reimbursement. So the circuit breaker reimbursement is money we do get from the state for our out of district placements. Um, the reimbursement rate this year was at 74.4 state mandated mandated to 75 so they are getting really close we actually anticipate for fiscal year 20 that they will be at 75 um, and so that money the way the town budgets has you guys do your budget we act like we're there is no circuit breaker so we're at 100 percent of every expense we think we're going to incur in out of district it sits in your 10 million dollar budget but at the end then um, the, the town gets back a million one um, so that really offsets your budget. So when you start seeing the numbers that go on the town reports, the numbers that get reported for actuals would be less the circuit breaker, but your budget is always gross. So always, I always think that throws people off because now with circuit breaker being a million dollars, you'll see reported expenses of like nine million for the previous year and your budget looks like it's gone up a lot, but it's just the circuit <coughs> breaker and how they record it. So I just want to highlight that to the new people because it, it mm -hmm. sort of uh, catches you off guard initially. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, yeah, so we will be returning to the town a million three, which is um, typical for us because the, the circuit breaker always goes back 100%. Any questions on just the regular operating? Well, if my math is correct-ish, um, on the out-of-district expenditures, I mean, you, know, you say we had a negative variance of eighty thousand dollars on about a three million dollar line item so we're talking like less than three percent yeah no, that, i mean that is a small amount um and what you see is the volatility though with the ins and outs even though we had three more placements we must have had some i mean we know we had some placements roll off that were larger amounts and replaced with smaller amounts so it just speaks to how sharp you look at this and how mm -hmm. accurate we are and you give us reported throughout the year so right. there aren't surprises yes but it but that's an area where I could show up tomorrow and it'd be a completely different story. Yeah, so no, yeah. it is a very volatile um, piece of our budget. That I, I keep, I can control the top part pretty well. <laughs> it's the bottom part that is just up to what's happening out there in, in our environment. Because um, we are looking at, I, we haven't pulled all the numbers together so far for you for fiscal year 20, but there has been a lot of movement both in and both uh, placements coming back and placements coming in and movement move outs. So um, we'll see where we land and it will continuously to change every month. I probably have a different sort of report for you. May to June, not so much, right? Because everything's settled. So basically what I reported in May is, is how we ended up in June. Mm -hmm. But throughout the other months, um, you know, don't be surprised if I show up with some, some variances that um, are larger. Either way. Yeah, and the, and the philosophy is continuing to try to keep these kids in district because I know yeah. that there was discussion last year about, and that's that kind of remains the same. It is. So that hopefully the number will eventually start to go down more. Yeah, that's the hope. I mean, obviously I know you can't right. control that. But. Right. It is. Um, where we can keep students in district, that's some of the new programs that we, that the towns, both towns sort of funded last year, our, our, our goal is to do that. The problem is, as we said, our cohort, you have to have a cohort in order to have a program. So where we have one-offs and the grade different, you know, the, the grade difference between someone in fifth grade and someone in eighth, so you can't bring those children to get those students together. It does tie our hands a little bit, but I think we are, I, I definitely think if you looked at Chickering, the trend. Um, we have much fewer students out than we did um, eight years ago. Pre-K was why we brought pre-K here was because one year we had eight pre-K uh, students placed out. So we do try to react to what we can service in district. Along those lines, <clears throat> the um, right now the legislature is taking up a bill to really uh, revamp school funding in Massachusetts, the Student Opportunity Act, which you may have heard of, but that could have a profound impact on us mm -hmm. in terms of our special education costs, circuit breaker uh, costs, and uh, most importantly, the special ed transportation costs uh, with the state uh, supposedly going to fund that 
that's a, a fairly sizable portion of our costs for out of district mm -hmm. placements. So you mean a positive impact? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, they we you get no reimbursement right now for mm -hmm. out of district transportation. Right. This bill has a four year phase in um, that would get us up to 100. percent I'm not so sure. That, that would be that would be a, a very well, very big exactly deal um, across the state because we we're just now getting to a point where circuit breaker, which has been mandated for you know a long long time, is just getting up to where it's going to be fully funded and what it's mandated at. So I, I have a little reservation about how they're going to pull in all the yeah. all the transportation within four years, have it 100 percent funded. Well, re regional um, transportation we'll was supposed to be 100 yeah. percent exactly when it first came out, and where right. are we now? Well, we're creeping up. There, we <laughs> might be at 80 percent this year. Oh, it's only 80. Yeah. Not bad. Right. Right. So that's right. Yeah. So I'm a little. Um, it's great if we get any kind of reimbursement on that, though. I think it's fabulous because it doesn't seem um, really right that the the, the districts. All over the, mm -hmm. you know, the state have to burden that that cost. Unanticipated. Sometimes. Unanticipated. Yeah. Yep. Frequently. How is the transportation going this year? Because last year started a little. Yeah. So it's been a much better okay. start. Um, so remember that uh, one of the larger towns from Except pulled out. Yeah. So then that means that the majority of our out of district transportation is being um, taken care of by Except and not contracted out. Oh, good. It was the contract okay. out issue, yeah. the companies yeah, that we were having that. issues with okay. last year. So that's been a positive. Um, it will be interesting this year, though, to see how we, how the accept members deal with transportation because it is a hot topic. Um, it is, it is a large piece of business to try to manage, and it's. Remember, we had some partial funding from uh, reserves for the fund balance. That brought that kept your cost from going up a lot with the Framingham being pulled out. Except so we're reserves. not going to have yeah. except right. reserves. Well, but yeah, that's only when the year. member reserve, right, 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 because Framingham basically was half of the, yeah. the model. Cool. Yeah, right. So um, we're just starting. We have our first meeting next week to start talking about what the matrix is going to look like, which is how we figure out the funding. Um, so that would be for transportation. And like yeah. us, you know, when in a hot economy. It's really hard to find drivers. drivers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's so, a lot of competition. So they were paying bonuses for some of our drivers to jump over to some of the others. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's um, gotten really competitive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, and then also included is just your special revenue and revolving funds. You get this statement quarterly. So these are your state your uh, fund balances as of June thirtieth. I'll just note that on the building rental, um, last year we did start assessing rental income or rental fees to the DITA um, program here in the SHEDA program at Pine Hill, who are run under the um, district, the, re the, the regional school district, but are housed in each of the elementary schools. So we started assessing them rent to use the, the building. So that will be, um, you, you picked up an extra $10,000 in your building rental fund that will help for any future building projects that come up um, it's at your discretion. So that was a positive. Okay. Who's capital on the agenda? Is there a capital? Yep, so we were just going to um, give an update on capital for fiscal year 20. I um, actually, before the meeting started, I mentioned to Brooke and Mark that uh, we'd hopefully be meeting in the next two weeks to put together the draft that will come forward to you at your October meeting. Okay. And then will be submitted the next morning to um, the, the Dover um, Capital Committee, the Town Committee. Um, so when we did meet this morning, uh, I met with Ralph and a contractor, so we're starting to look at doing um, the lobbies, the flooring of the lobbies. So I anticipate that's going to be on your fiscal year 21. Is that on the on-site report? Yeah. Okay. So we pushed it out a yeah, little bit, yeah. but um, we're going to now start probably attacking all the floors here, given that they're now approaching like 18 to 20 years, uh, 2001, yeah. 19 years old. So we're looking at doing the upstairs lobby and the downstairs lobby. So I'll go over that with your subcommittee and um, the other issues that we have. Um, the other one that we'll have to sort of really tackle with is the playground um, floor. Yeah, so ask. we'll start those discussions again with your subcommittee, mm -hmm. come back and see what the feelings are. I did have um, Mr. Kelly refresh um, our numbers just recently to see where we are. And we're still at a pretty high ticket item to do that uh, complete repair in the manner in which it is now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think 
there needs to be some discussion of what direction we want to go and then see what other parties we bring in um, to further discuss that. So I do think it's something that we've pushed off and now needs to be addressed this year so we have a plan for next summer. Okay. Uh, the other last thing I just want to mention is that, um, so we incurred a lightning strike here on um, July 5th. Um, I that, to. yeah, here. <laughs> so, uh, it's like back to the future. <laughs> yeah. Clock stop, and we can figure out how to get well, somewhere. Does it happen every day? Well, talk about clock stopping. So, they do show up to um, school on Monday morning and wonder why a third of the building's lights are off. So, um, it struck right outside the a little bit on the turnaround pavement by the sidewalk, went down and hit one of our electrical lines coming in, blew one of the circuit breakers, but also blew out all your exterior lights and caused a little havoc on our um, our fire control panel system and also all the emergency lights. So we did file a claim with um, the town's insurance from here, but we're looking at probably about a $30,000 um, final cost to get everything back up to where it should be from that damage. Um, the strike was caught on tape. Yes, it? the strike they were able, because you have cameras, they went and they pinpointed it was at 5.45 p.m. Mm -hmm. You could actually see it coming down and little pieces of like asphalt sort of going up. So um, but they didn't know what it was initially because it was just, there was no physical evidence and it was just strange that only a third of the lights were out. Um, but you had to replace one of your circuit breakers, all the exterior lights, and about 50 of the emergency lights because the the power had been off, the batteries were on, and they were set. They were original, 2001, and it just wore them out. So um, we had to replace them all. So that was a busy summer. Mm -hmm. um, it took away from some other projects that we had our, our electrician wanted to do, but um, it has all been uh, almost completed. He's just got to finish some of the outdoor lights, and we will submit our final claim um, to the insurance company for that. So you'll see big bills going through, but know that we'll get all, all of it back except for the deductible um, to go against our, our line item in our budget. Well, okay. Rob, hopefully you're in good shape too. I, basically, the, everything that happened at this school happened to me. Yeah. So, uh, wow. Good news too. Yeah. Waiting for the check to come. Yeah. <laughs> it could always be worse though. Exactly. So yeah. Let's just think our lucky stars. Um, thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. Anything anyone has for Don? Report. Um, can I can I chat with you after sure. just about something about how you do budgets? Sure, Thanks. absolutely. Great. It's a brief talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next item on the agenda is there was a request um, by the Norfolk County Sheriff. Um, his name is Jerry Mc McDermott uh, for a school committee representative in our county, which. Middlesex is sure, but we're in Norfolk, um, to sit on a task force uh, to talk about um, sort of juvenile um, substance abuse and behavior and mental uh, health. So, you know, clearly we've talked a lot about it within our building, um, and this is getting to the level where, um, you know, the uh, people within the county are starting to think about how, what else can be done or we can share ideas, and he wants to put together a task force that's going to be quarterly. Uh, it's on the agenda as an action to take if anyone's interested in volunteering. Um, if not, we can, I could table this item and we can talk about it sort of offline, but it's, I don't have a lot of details other than quarterly meeting. Um, first one will probably be in October uh, with the other towns within the county uh, to talk about sort of ideas of programs that he thinks is important or other law enforcement officials that we might want to bring back to our district to discuss. Is there anyone that would be interested and we can nominate or? I would be interested to find out more. Yeah. Me too. It depends when the meeting. So why don't we do this? Um, we can put you in touch. We can talk. Uh, you might be sort of temporarily appointed, meaning that someone from Dover. <laughs> I saw will, what you did. Say. Someone from Dover will go and be there. Um, but you can start and at least talk to them and then understand what the first meeting is like and if we need to swap someone out based on agendas. I, mean, I don't know if it's midday. Yeah, no, I don't know if it's exactly. evening. It's in Dedham, which is convenient. Not too bad. Okay. Um, but why don't we do this? Why don't we do an action? That's, I'd ask if we have a nominate. If I could take a nomination, take a make a motion to um, temporarily nominate Brooke Matteris as the Dover's representative on the Joint Task Force. We need to find temporarily. <laughs> Until you find out whether you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> do I have a motion? Rachel, second. Leslie. Discussion? In favor? 
A little too quick. Right? <laughs> Congratulations. It doesn't have to be. It's right up my alley, though. No, it's it's helpful. Helpful. It would be helpful. It might help. Um, it's help. You're doing a lot with guidance advisory and challenge success. I yeah. think you'll find. It might help when you drive around the communities, too. What do you mean? Because you get to know a lot. A lot of, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. Thank you very much. Um, the next item um, is our consent agenda. So we have the approval of the minutes from our June 10th, 2019 meeting that are in your packet. Does anyone have any changes or comments? Okay, hearing, um, actually, we do it to consent all at once. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. Do Yes, I had a comment. This includes the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Yeah, so the right? next one, which is part of the consent, is uh, the information that's in um, our packet around a donation from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And Laura, I'm putting you on the spot, but my hunch is you'd like to give us a little background. You added some of the comments here. Sure. That'd be great. We'd be happy to do that. And we have two people from Make-A-Wish today. Yay! <laughs> thank you. So thank you for coming. Uh, the, uh, one of our families, was given the opportunity to make a wish, and they very generously um, wanted to make a donation to the school. And so Make a Wish uh, worked with some people here to talk about what might be created at the school that reflects the child's interests, uh, and a concept of a geodesic dome was brought up that would integrate um, um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> have a sensory integration and work with um, augmented reality uh, and create an opportunity for individuals and for groups and, and potentially entire classes to go in um, and have really meaningful experiences um, with, with the use of technology. Uh, the, the dome is a, a temporary structure. Uh, that can be created here on site. Uh, we look forward to seeing what um, is accepted, what opportunities that would bring to our students at large because it ties into these priorities that we've had for a number of years. I'm happy to take any other questions or if you'd like to direct them to the folks at the back who want to do that as well. I have a couple operational questions. Sure. Um, you, know, you mentioned in sort of the FAQ, um, setting it up, you know, someone can help set up and maybe with some volunteers, yeah. who takes down? Because it's temporary, it's in a very, proposed to be in a very common place, thinking about arts night and other time when that mm -hmm. space gets used. My first assumption is it's not a permanent, like here, up all year. You can answer that question first. And then if it is an up all year, how does it get taken down and stored? Part of the setting up is they'll train us on the Okay, so our current staff would be able to do that. You don't need to bring in a, someone else to do it. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I'm, just, I'm thinking we have to pay somebody to do this. She's an EMT. She can do it. <laughs> where, would we, where would we keep it? Uh, the the structure itself, I, I think of as something like connects, where the pieces um, are assembled together, and then there's a covering that goes over the exterior, uh, which is uh, fireproof material. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's, it's assembling those pieces together. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you would like to add or listen to that. We hope you say yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's something theoretically could be set up in the gym or even outside at some point when we can go outside again and Right. Enjoy that. One of the visits, we actually walk around the school and considered a number of uh, different yeah. possible areas, including one at the back of the library. At Chickering, the arts are so prominent and wonderfully visible. Uh, one of the ideas we put forward is that this would serve as another piece of public art, mm -hmm. um, and that it's visually attractive. Uh, it's something that you know, we would love to invite parents to see and, and enter into. And um, I, I think we'll see a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. evolve for that for, for general learning. And how do you, since you guys probably done this before, how do you tie this to the specific gift or, or, or from this child or this family? Like, how do we, do we brand it? Do we? Sure, I think yeah. you talked about if there's a special way to put 
yeah. child came or some way in honor of what his wish yeah. was to get back to Which is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I hope yeah. we'll be heavily mm -hmm. promoted and, mm -hmm. you know, I can, very it's very, it's really incredibly yeah, heartwarming. Types of wishes we have, you know, most, most kids either wish to go somewhere. Of course, or, or meet Tom Brady. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give something back yeah. to school, I think less than 1% of the wishes. Uh -huh. be well, that's what needs to be promoted. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's right. really you know, incredibly uh, powerful. company that we're working with, uh, Daycon, that's a design and build firm. Uh, they've been very generous with their time. They've brought in other donors for specific parts of the, of the geodome, and they're certainly very interested in promoting it. If you're open to it, we already have a connection with Channel 5 to come and do a story on it yeah, if you're open exactly. to doing that. Um, so we certainly, you know, want to both recognize the donors that were involved in it, but really this was, you know, this child's wish, and it's really just a very unique wish uh, and to give something back to the school. Okay. Thank you, and thank you so much for your help. I, I still go back to, I mean, this is the first we're hearing about it, and it sounds like there's been a lot of stuff already done, and I just want to know, like, where are we going to keep it? Like, do you have, do we have space to store it? What does it look like? Uh, I'm not sure of the dimensions of it once it is collapsed and, and put together. Um, we did notify folks initially in May, and um, we have reached out to make sure that everything uh, would be up to code. I don't think it's going to come up and down every week. It's going to be up for a stretch of time, come down when we have the art show. But when it's down, storage. Like, do we have space in closets? In your basement. Like, <laughs> we have storage in the gym. Things in, for example, the, the uh, computer lab next door. We have the mm -hmm. hallway closets, too, with the papers. Okay. Through. All right. We have storage. I don't know if you know, so we go down the halls. Each hallway has three or four storage closets along it. If you don't notice something better, like the stuff isn't falling out of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that the the you can you can kind of guesstimate based on the dimensions of the, the dome itself being um, 15. I don't have my good glasses. 15 feet across, I think, yeah. and nine feet tall. So that means the sections probably break into three, four foot sections. I'm guessing, and um, I don't think it's going to be simple to put together it will be some time for sure but um but i do think that it breaks down you can see the pictures of the parts i do I'm, uh, does it actually have a list i mean the, um, si the size it does have of the some, pipes yes i think i saw about three feet somewhere let's see that makes sense um, yeah 25 to 34 five inches depending on the pipe piece but All right. that's under three feet so yeah. I, mean, I think it, it will probably be bulky because there will be a lot of those, but I do think we can find a place to store here. Okay. Well, do you have any concerns with storage or assembly or disassembly? Okay. I, I don't. And um, my understanding is that this this is a is a kit that is then being customized. So I think anytime there's a kit, it it comes um, right. with the idea that other people who have not designed it um, will be able to put it together and. Be able to store it. And I apologize if you've already mentioned this, but will there be an un unveiling or a presentation of it? Or? We would like to do that. Yeah, I think the idea was to uh, hopefully in early October have uh, the firm to do the uh, construction, obviously minimize any impact to the school during the day, try and do it. Uh, around that time, um, and then once once sort of everything's up and running and working, and we know you know pick another day to have a unveiling. I know people from the design company would like to come. Our CEO would come, and we'd like to arrange to uh, have Channel Five come and, and do a little story on it. And the family would be here. The family. Yeah, and the family, yeah. this family yeah. too. Sorry, I don't think yeah. we know that. That's fantastic. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. <sighs> What's that? It's just the, the, and then the OT beam uh, is basically a gift from a family, um, a parent. Uh, we play straight and curved tactile path beam, something that they can use with our students. Uh, our occupational therapists can use with our students. Is there anything you would add to that, Laura? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, including the minutes, the donation uh, for the biosphere, and the OT beam as presented in our packet? Those Second. 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 Second.
Rachel. Discussion? All in favor? Great. Thank you. Um, and then we have our community comments, which are also part of the packet. Um, you've seen all those. One thing I will point out is on our calendar, which we just scroll past, we have a joint school committee meeting on October 1st, which is Tuesday at the middle school at 6.30. And then our next Dover school committee meeting will be October 22nd with a 5.30 start, because we're going to piggyback with a joint school committee meeting afterwards. Um, so that will be at the Dover Shore Middle School. And you have a quorum on the first, because I did tell Cheryl I couldn't be there. Can everyone else be there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are all set. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for asking. Great. Uh, any other items you want to bring up? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think the poll to go into executive session, uh, not to return into open meeting uh, to discuss uh, personnel update. So we don't leave anywhere yet. You have to verbally say yes to poll. Leslie? Yes. Brooke? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Mark? Yes. Henry? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.